How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. All right. Doing I'm going to, we got complaints about this. Oh. So I'm just going to sit like this the whole podcast. I'll do this too. There we go. So you can't, you can't tell the difference. Yeah, there we go. We're not carpenters no. like, like Jesus. So that's right. I, no, this is not the type of work I get into. Yeah. Part of me wanted to make it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't tell me who. who <laughs> well, you know who, and that's why. <laughs> I told you already, but yeah. Well, hey, um, I do want to tell you that chapter 13, verses 8 through uh, 13, right? Uh, 14 through 4. Wait, I'm looking at the wrong chapter. Yep, yep. 8 through 13. 13. 8 through 13. Yep, last section. And we uh, had live group on Wednesday with our group. And, uh, man, I walked in sort of confused. And so I really, really appreciate you for Mm. flushing everything out. Um, It was simple. It was um, um, just easy to hear you lay out like some of these things that you've uh, encountered in your study. Um, and I think I, I understand it a, a whole lot more. Like some of the confusing parts about it was Paul like brings in that whole, he tries to make a metaphor about like, um, um, let's see, in verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke yep. like a child. And I think that really confused me because like, I thought he was talking about, Christian maturity, mm-hmm. uh, being able to let go of certain things uh, because now we're more mature in the faith. Um, and that's not what he meant. He meant that he he related the child to um, the way we view things right now, looking mm-hmm. dimly at a mirror, and things will become much more clear when we're in our fullness, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, face to face. Face yep. to face. Yep. So. Yeah, that that I think I appreciate you for clearing a lot of that up for me, man. I appreciate that. I honestly would say that is completely due to the graciousness of our body um, that we're given the time to dig into the passages. Mm-hmm. Because um, I wasn't I wasn't setting you up as you were sharing some of that confusion, even in life group or asking questions and just sitting back with the answers going. Err. I wasn't done with my stuff, <laughs> and so I hadn't dug into like some of that, and and I. There's a part of me that wishes like everybody could experience what it's like to yeah. prepare and that light coming on moment that, um, you know, maybe we'll even get into this a little later when we're talking about gifts and things. But like times where sometimes even as you're preaching, you're getting ready to communicate something. And in the midst of getting ready to communicate it, you're mm-hmm. understanding it more significantly than you did before you started the sermon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, wow. You know, and it's like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we have a responsibility to dig in and do the work. I think the Lord seeks to honor that mm-hmm. by trying to help bring clarity. Again, I wouldn't claim if I'm going to be consistent with the passage. I'm not going to claim that that sermon was was the end all and nailed it and understood everything perfectly. I mean, it was still a man who was partial mm-hmm. with a partial understanding, yeah. doing his best to share it with all of us yeah. who are waiting the day that we'll fully fully know. Just like we already are fully known. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I like the the way you talk about that mirror. Um, I am a his, his, history buff, buff, and I like watching historical movies. And um, you ever see like in I don't know Brave Ghostbusters? Oh, not no. well, Braveheart or anything like that, where the mirror, like when they made mirrors back then, it yeah, wasn't yeah, the mirror yeah. you see today. Yeah. Yeah. Like they did their best to see themselves in the mirror, but it was like. It, imperfect mm-hmm. right there was blemishes there mm-hmm. were like little um splotches and color cloudy it got cloudy yeah, yeah and i thought that if you if you don't know that about mirrors from those times then it would be very confusing to understand yeah yeah you know what i mean because, yeah. well, i'm looking at a mirror i see myself yeah clearly yeah well not during the time maybe when paul was writing mirrors were yeah. that advanced or even like you know i I think it was about a year ago I redid our bathroom, the one that's under the stairs. Yeah. And in the past, it had just one little light over kind of near the wall and, a, and an old mirror mounted straight to the wall. Well, when we redid the bathroom, I put in a medicine cabinet with a newer mirror mm-hmm. that was better glass, but also added two lights. Mm. 
and now I can shave in there. <laughs> Whereas before, it was like I didn't even trust that I'd gotten all, all everything off of my nose yeah. before I came out of the bathroom. Exactly. Little patch right you there. know, you you wouldn't even blow your nose and then think you got all the Kleenex lint because the lights the light was dim and the mirror wasn't that great a mirror. Light makes a big difference. Yeah. So I think even that like we see in a mirror dimly. Yeah. If we wanted to use even the illustration of mirrors today which I do think it's always helpful to take people back to mm. that era mm. and then bring us application back to it. So yeah. it's like don't, crossing the bridge. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but even then it's like, yeah, it'd be like, it's great if you've got a, a good mirror in your house, but if it's not well lit, mm. it's not doing you a lot of good. Yeah. You're still, you're getting reflection of shadow yeah. instead. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Hey, somebody did ask a question. Um, and um, I don't know if it's a new member, um, a person who just visited. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we they wanted to know about the word love, like the Greek word love. So what was meant here? Like which because you, you gave us four different types of the words love. So I just wanted to yeah, yeah. briefly about yeah, I think yeah. two weeks ago we kind of hit that at the beginning of First Corinthians 13 with it, uh, both in the sermon and maybe we followed up in the podcast a little bit too, of like, yeah, there's and it's similar to like in the English, we'll talk about, oh, I love my favorite sports team mm-hmm. or I love this food item. We love somebody we work with and we love our children and our spouse differently than any of those mm-hmm. should. Right. Yeah. Or we're not a very good dad. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of what scripture does. Even when you see love, the, the Greek language had a, a love that was more of like a passion, had another one that was more of like brotherly love, yeah. associating it's together Philo or Philo yeah, or where you get Philadelphia. Yeah. So it's that kind of idea. There was another one that's used for like a, a parent to a child. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be your literal child, but kind of that feeling of almost protection and care, mentoring. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's agape, mm-hmm. which is the one that's in this passage, which the, the two things we kind of drew out that first week was it's a love that requires being manifested. Mm-hmm. So a person might feel desire towards someone else, but they never voice it, mm-hmm. but they still feel that, yeah. right? Um, you might even feel a fatherly affection toward, you know, a, a person you've been training or, you know, a kid that you're coaching or, you know, another family member, a niece or a nephew or something that, and you don't have to necessarily voice it, mm. but you feel it. Agape can't just reside in feeling. Okay. Agape must be expressed. It must be manifested. It must be shown. So if my wife says, hey, I know you love me, but you haven't shown me. If I were to show her, that would be. She's probably asking, yeah, I want to see a little bit of that agape. Yeah. Not just you think I look nice in this dress. Let's go beyond that, you know. Right. So, yeah. Um, and then obviously what we and then that grid, we ran it through last week where we said when we see what love is, um, we are reminded, first of all, this flows from God. He has manifested all those things, patient, kind, doesn't boast, you know, doesn't envy. We fail at those. Yeah. Jesus perfectly fulfilled them and now united in Christ, we can walk in them too. So it is a call for us yeah. to show this kind of love, even though this kind of love originated from God. So I've heard people argue that before of like, well, agape love is God's love and you and I can never match up to it. Yeah. And it's like, well, you're right. Agape love is God's love. Yeah. And apart from fellowship with God, I don't think we ever really get there. But once we are in Christ, mm. we are we are capable of showing that kind of love to others as well. Sacrificial love that takes the initiation and displays it. Yeah. 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 Can we talk real quick about, and I keep landing on this because you know my history, but you know, prophecy yeah. and tongues. Yeah. 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 Like that. Clearly, um, you know, Paul is saying, Hey, it doesn't sound like he's, and we talked about this in life group. Like he's not, doesn't sound like he's discounting mm-hmm. any of those things. Mm-hmm. And man, uh, you know, the more and more I meet other pastors and look at read their books and hear their side and see the research that they're doing, there's, there's so many different beliefs on these things. And so, like, I don't know if it matters where I land, but like coming from the church work that we we went to, and I know it was not a lot of good things that we learned, but there were some great things that we also learned. And, you know, the sign gifts are one big one. And I and I have conversations with folks in Richmond about that all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I stand and I don't know if it matters. Yeah. Be- you know, and I, I love it that you said that uh, on Sunday that, like, love is going to, like, when everything gets blown up, 
and we get moved, you know, we we're there with Christ. Like love is is still going to be the the flag waving in the air, and everything else will pass away. And but man, like I still can't like un- let go of. Well, is it true or yeah? Not? Like, yeah. yeah. Did this really go down, yeah. or are we? Just, is this false and fake? What's going on? Yeah. So I don't know, man. Like, there's books on <laughs> cessationism. Yep. And I'm like, do I go back and talk to my brother about this? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. have you read this? Yeah. Help me out. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's been interesting for me. Like, I think I shared it with the body. Maybe it was this week. I can't remember. Of like, yeah, you can you can approach passages thinking they're going to accomplish something, and in doing so, if you approach it for that purpose, you can miss fuller extent of what God's intention is for. So that's why we found it most beneficial as a church to just preach through books of the Bible as the main course. Mm -hmm. We'll sometimes do one-offs or maybe a topical sermon when something comes up. But for the main course, most of the time, we're just letting the next passage preach itself. Mm -hmm. And if we're preaching it faithfully, then you or me or Kearns or whoever's preaching that week goes to the passage and is asking, what is this passage about? Whereas if I read a passage, I think, oh, this is on Luke 11 on prayer and going, oh, this passage is all about prayer. And I dig in, I'll probably pull out some things that are about prayer, but maybe the fullest part of the sermon was the passage isn't really about prayer. It's in the context of something else. Um, I previously came to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 thinking if we really mine into this bad boy, it was this week because we're talking about the perfect and things. Um, that we'll be able to discern when they stopped, when they started, if they stopped, if they whatever. So you came, um, you came into it? Thinking? I thought when we said we were going to do First Corinthians as a church, yeah. once we got here, we'd probably get to a point. And it would kind of be the, because we've never really drawn a line in the sand. Yeah. So it'd be like, well, this is finally the drawing the line in the sand and, for and the from church. The, and from the beginning, you and I have... We we all wrestle, through, but we, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so here now here's two funny things that have come to me from that is and you've used the two terms and they're 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 terms that are helpful uh there's cessationism which you hear the word to cease in the midst of it so it's a belief that that these gifts have ceased um there's continuationism which is pretty odd. continue mm-hmm. is so the idea that no all of the gifts continue there's far extremes of both. So there are cessationists who on their far extreme would teach that like this whole concept of spiritual gifts is an old school idea. Happened in a season, doesn't happen anymore. Your musical gifts, your preaching gifts, your your administrative gifts, those are just your skills. They're not spiritual gifts like the Bible is talking about. That's gone. That's on the far extreme. The far extreme of continuationists are like, it all continues. So call me Apostle Marco and (laughs) call me, you know, and just kind of takes it to its fullest extent. And I would offer that I think both of the far extremes become a distortion. Okay. Um, Now, here's what's funny then. So you you kind of bring it back, not to those far extremes, but somewhere kind of in the middle. Make it, you know, more about like these sign gifts. Do you think they still exist? Continuationists. Do you think they no longer exist? Yeah. Cessationists. In conversations with other people, <laughs> I will find brothers of mine saying to me, oh, within your continuationist, if that's what you believe. And I'm like, oh, OK. I guess I, Harbor Network says we're a continuationist network. So I'm like, OK, well, then I guess we belong there. <laughs> I'll have conversations with other brothers that are like, no, that makes you a cessationist. And so then I'm like, wait a minute. What? What am I? (laughs) Here's what's interesting. I think I've come under some conviction in light of where we've been already in 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 Corinthians and thinking like chapter one through three. If I'm asking the question to figure out what camp you're in, I'm probably coming about it wrong because I'm already saying, wait, are you of Apollos or of Paul or of Peter? Or Jesus, yes. let me know whether to size you up as oh, whether you're a faithful brother or not. Oh man, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. So I'm pulling away from that and saying, Lord, free me from that. Come Release us from that perspective. Yes, yes. I just want to linger on that for a minute. Dude. Yeah, we have, we have a timer on the podcast. Maybe you linger you. after. I am going to linger. Like, so, Dude. yeah, so that's part of it. And God, by God's grace, may he continue to challenge 
and change both the hearer and the preacher of his word, you know? So it's like, I, I hope that's a good sign of going like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want the label to dust, decide a camp. Yeah. We still got to do, okay, so what's Greenville Grace going to do moving forward? Mm. I will say, um, I personally probably lean more to the direction that I think the gifts, when you take, and this becomes a whole bigger conversation, maybe we should do a one-off podcast that's about all of the passages of pulling them together. But you're watching the realm of the gifts in the book of Acts taking place, and then even even referred to in the, the epistles. They seem to be the the these manifestations of sign gifts, and by the very name we give them, sign gifts, they're, they're an evidence of a working of God that seems to go more in like frontline ministry than maybe further back. That like the longer a church has been established and is in the gospel and has the word of God accessible to them, Mm -hmm. the less prevalent those gifts seem to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily where I land is not in like a time period of like, well, by 107 AD, the gift ceased. And then, you know, it's more, you know, um, the example I've given to people before, and they're like, well, then, you, brother, you are absolutely a conti- continuationist. Is like, what would be a modern day application? And it'd be like, man, um, part of the Middle East opens up mm-hmm. and we can suddenly get into it. And so you and I go and we learn Farsi. And so because we're going to go in and we want to present the gospel to people in their original language so they can hear the name of Jesus in their native tongue. So we study the language and we get to a Middle Eastern country and we're traveling and we bump into a group of nomadic people that are traveling. And you and I share the gospel and Farsi with them. They listen, they interact, we talk, whether they receive it or not, the communication breakdown is gone. Like we're interacting with them. They go their way. We get to the village we were intending to get to. We find brothers or sisters there. And we're like, man, we just had the most incredible interaction with so-and-so. And And they're like, oh, yeah, we know the people group they're a part of. We didn't know you knew. And they name a different language. And you and I go, no, we. I think we were speaking in Farsi. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, those people don't speak in Farsi. Like something happened. Mm -hmm. Like I'd say, do I think God can do that today? 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that that front line thing. They don't have the word of God before them. They don't have the name of Jesus in their own language, you know. And so God can overcome those things to validate the gospel that's being brought there. Yeah. Mm. Um, I mean that that would be in line with Pentecost because right. I think know, that follows more kind of the yeah. scriptural norm. Now, and I'm not saying, boy, I unless it's in that front line gospel context, it couldn't necessarily happen. But I'm saying. That doesn't seem far fetched to me yeah. at all. Um, do we? And and I think this even goes back to our earlier conversation in chapter twelve. Um, do we have a responsibility to label everything that happens within the church with bodies of the body of believers as one of the gifts listed in Scripture? No. Yeah. Um, because. I don't think any list in scripture given to us was given as the exhaustive list. Here are the gifts, Mm -hmm. right? It just listed some. So if you or I had moments where like, apart from any other way to describe it, it was like the spirit of the Lord was pressing down upon us to do this or say this or change a course of action, maybe even to declare it to somebody else. Absolutely. Do I feel the need? Is that prophecy? Mm -hmm. Maybe. So maybe it's still happening. Um, or is it just a word from the Lord, you know, God granting biblical wisdom to apply, even if you didn't have a text that went right with it? Yeah. Like, I don't need to necessarily label it. Yeah. Um, and so that would be that side of the argument. The other side is I think I've become more and more aware of what it means to be an elder of a local church means that I don't have any authority in any other church. Mm. And so I think back in my younger, uh, more energetic, maybe more belligerent days. I like to use the word hothead. <laughs> maybe, maybe some of that. I would think, man, I'd get to the bottom of this passage, and then it becomes my responsibility mm-hmm. to take it everywhere else. Yeah. 
how about we just seek to do it here? Yeah. And so somebody comes to us and says, hey, I'll give you an example. Have you seen the stuff that's like the reports that are coming out of Asbury? Mm-mm. There's a, a school in Kentucky who probably starting like Wednesday or Thursday of last week was started after a chapel service was starting to experience like revival that they've had a service that's just about gone on 24 seven all the way up through today. We're recording on Monday and people have gone down news media starting to report on it that uh, apparently uh, the guy that preached chapel was like out of Romans 12 calling us to love one another like we should. And kids started repenting of ways they weren't loving. And there's been pockets and it's, Twitter is a horrible place to be sometimes, uh, but there's pockets where you can read on it and there's people right away going, this is revival. This is it. This is what we've been praying for. Or keep, you know, and there's other people that are looking and going, eh, it might just be emotionalism. Mm-hmm. It might be revivalism, mm-hmm. which is a whole different thing than revival. Um, you know, somebody came to me. I was like, hey, what do you make of Asbury? What, what do you think? Is something real happening? I think nowadays, <laughs> my very real answer, which is probably different than what it would have been a decade ago, is I don't know. <laughs> like I like I love it. <laughs> and it, it's my brothers and sisters in Christ, so I care in that sense. But as far as like if it's real, it's real. And by God's grace, may it work its way to Dark County, and may we exhibit it too. If and then once it comes to our church, we as elders will talk through. Okay, yeah. what does revival really look like? Sure. How do we do more than just feel emotion? What are we going to do with all these people that are confessing their sin to help them walk in freedom? What are going to do with evangelism that takes place and reaching more people? And we'll deal with it then. Yeah. Until then, I'm praying mm. for the people that are involved in it. I'm praying that it that revival would spread our country yeah. and our world. Um. But it's not my job to sit back here and 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 be the detective that figures out <laughs> genuine or not, right? Um, so I would say the same thing in regard to like, okay, well, hey, I heard church down the street. They did such and such and such and such. Okay. Yeah. I was busy that Sunday. Yeah. I was here. So yeah. I don't know. And it's not my job to necessarily evaluate. Now, I think, you know, that could become overly concrete or harsh. Yeah. Uh, churches that we've got relationships with and stuff, if things were happening or, um, you know, you just thought maybe something the pastor said from the pulpit wasn't really wise or whatever. I think if you have loving relationships, you can go to that brother and say, hey, I heard the following. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Walk me through it. And I think we got to do that with curiosity and humility rather than like, again, thinking, oh, brother so-and-so obviously has partial knowledge. Let me come bring. No, I've got partial knowledge too. Well, I'm glad to hear you say this for a lot of reasons. I mean, as a new pastor, preacher, um, elder, like rubbing, you know, I'm not sure, I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, rubbing shoulders with with some of the folks that we do, um, those guys are brilliant, have brilliant minds. Yeah. And it's easy. You know it is. Yeah. To camp in one or the other area. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's, you're right. Like, where do you stand? This is what we do. Be like us. Yeah. You know nobody's saying that, but I think it's nobody's saying be like us, but it's easy to like want to feel, how can I put it? If it, it, I want to do the right thing, yeah. I want to, I want these guys seem to have it right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, and, they're, and they seem God honoring, which I know they are. Yeah. So, you know, I'll camp over here. Yeah. And and for me, hearing you say that, it frees me up to be able to say, I know what's going on. Yeah. And here's here's the beauty of where I think the flow of the text even goes. Is chapter 12 is really laying out God gifts different people different ways. Mm-hmm. So don't look down on somebody gifted differently than you mm-hmm. and don't withhold your gifts because you find them less significant than somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah. The center, yeah. the meat of that sandwich is why are we here together anyway, is to love God and love one another. Yeah. And then chapter 14, though, is going to say, but that doesn't mean it's a free for all. Yeah. Like there's some parameters, there's some order and structure that needs to happen so that we can love each other well and love our unsaved neighbor yeah. who might might be there. Well, that was my last question to you. Like, I think Christians feel an obligation to defend, mm-hmm. um, especially the way the world's going. And there's this push from, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to say it delicately. 
there's this tolerance movement mm. where mm. where if you don't believe or hold to what I what I'm doing, what I believe in, what I think is right, then you you know you're a bigot, you're you know all yeah. all yeah. things. Yeah. And so my question, I guess, if if if, if tongues and prophecy and everything like that is passing away and the one thing that will be there is love okay so some of the these these sins that we tend to go after mm-hmm. um that that really like get us fired up as christians that will also pass away mm-hmm. so what do we do like do we continue do we do we just let love ride mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah yeah, we we tackled that a little bit last week when we were looking at love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Mm. We cannot, um, under the guise of calling it love, just leave a person in their sin and judgment mm-hmm. before God. And so what God declares to be wrong, we need to be a people who faithfully proclaim it to be wrong. I think we need to do it lovingly. Mm. And one of the things you said was like, you know, the world is looking at us and I love, you know, what answer do we give? Well, Peter says, you're always to be, always be prepared to give an answer Mm. for what? For the hope that lies within you. And I think, unfortunately, some of what's happened in our conversations with a world that's pressing sin upon the church and saying, call it righteous, call it righteous, quit saying it's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That what they're doing is they're trying to call us to do what we cannot do. Mm-hmm. And our moment in that feeling backed up is to feel scared, mm-hmm. to feel pressured, to feel defensive, mm-hmm. to feel angry. And then we respond in those things and we don't understand why the apologetic isn't working. Why isn't my answer good enough? Because we're not answering for the hope that lies within. And we talked about that a little bit last week. If I think that becomes part of the challenge, we need to know confidently in our hearts and dig into this deeply with, you know, through prayer and scripture of God, how are, for instance, your sexual morals, how are they good news? Mm -hmm. How is this actually leading toward hope? How are we not just calling somebody, not just turn and burn, turn or burn, Mm -hmm. you know, if you keep on that path, destruction is waiting for you, but something else is offered. Yes. And at the same time say, and the reason why that leads to destruction is it's its end result because it is contrary to what God designed you for and desires for you and where your true hope can be found. And so we've got to do a faithful job. And I think that starts with us as a church. I think when we talk to each other about the things that we see going on around us in the world, We need to lovingly and faithfully, when we can hear a brother or sister that's afraid, that's defensive, that's getting angry, um, that we we hear them and we hear why they feel that way, but we help encourage them toward hope Mm -hmm. so that when they leave, yeah, you might lose your job because you refuse to support some new standard that your work is wanting you to proclaim loudly. Or yes, you know, our kids might really hear some trash you know, being taught that we have to evaluate whether we even want to subject them to that, or how do we teach them contrary, whatever we got, we got work to do, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but we can hope. Yeah. Because when we, we, we're not the only ones working. Right. And so God will work in it. So I think, um, why do we, if all of that stuff's going to pass away, Mm -hmm. why do we still faithfully proclaim and call people? Because when we see him face to face, Mm -hmm. first Peter also says this, Um, when we see him face to face, the opportunity for repentance is over. Mm. And so our seeing him face to face is tremendously good news for us. Others outside of Christ seeing him face to face means they are beyond the place of being able to repent. And so um, I think we need to be that people who call one another to hold fast to what the scriptures say, call righteousness, righteousness, Mm. and call wrongdoing, wrongdoing, and call the world Mm. to righteousness. Not try and create a whole system that forces it on people or whatever, but by faith, calling them individually to righteousness with hope. Yeah, with hope. I think that was the beauty. Somehow, the, our brothers and sisters before us mm. went to a martyr's death 
And those who were watching could not comprehend the peace that these people felt. Mm. Wait a minute, you are just now, you're going to be burnt, I mean, and dying in painful ways. Not just like, oh, I know that when I die, I'll be with Jesus or whatever. But like, you're looking at some torture leading to your death. And yet their hope was visible. And people were looking and going, I don't understand that. (laughs) That doesn't make sense. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to leave you here with uh, verse 13. It says, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. We love you guys. Remember, Christ has done all the work, so we're just driving home. Peace.